Yeah, so welcome everyone. I'm Martin Pitt. I'm the current shepherd of Red Hat's cockpit team. And today I want to show you how you can embed cockpit in your, into your larger computing environment. So first of all, I hope that most people in the room will already have seen cockpit. But uh, just in case you didn't, here's the super, super quick intro. So conceptually, uh, cockpit is a Linux session that runs in a web browser, as opposed to SSH session running in a terminal or a GNOME session running on a graphics card. This exposes your server onto a web browser. And so it's a tool for experimenting, for learning, for troubleshooting, and for doing infrequent tasks. For example, you could spend, like for, if you add a new physical volume to your LVM about once a year, you can spend like an hour of going through the main pages and trying to come up with this. And of course, you see there's lots of opportunity to screw up and make typos and stuff. Or you can log into Cockpit. I mean, I've, I hope that everyone has seen it before. So we go to the storage page. We go to our LVM. And we want to add a new PV. That gives me a list of available ones. There's not too many to choose from. And I can just click around and grow this, and it's fairly safe. Let's just give it the whole thing, doesn't matter. And so this also makes Cockpit accessible to uh, people who are not familiar with all the Windows concepts. But, so aside from making Linux accessible to more people, it also makes it accessible to many more places that uh, traditional SSH-based approaches don't reach to. For example, I mean, here's a classic Windows 10, standard installation, like nothing else. I can open Edge. I have cockpit in that thing. It looks exactly like what you would expect. And without any further software on that servers, I can open a terminal in cockpit and hack around. Well, of course, I do typos because so many people are watching. But you get the idea. So no extra software. <clears throat> so, how do we get out of here? And likewise, um, there's also mobile devices these days. So, of course, I'm not going to show my phone here, it's too small. But we made a lot of effort of making cockpit accessible on mobile devices in small screen format. So you see, that's the storage page that you say saw early on. I mean, it might be not look great, but I mean, it's useful. So there is administration in your pocket. <clears throat> And all of that works with pretty much zero configuration on your server, aside from possibly installing the cockpit package, some distributions install it by default, and then enabling the, the cockpit socket type. And there it is. But wait pity, you say? I mean, this is all fine and good, but I mean, I don't really want to install like 10,000 web servers on my 10,000 machines. And in large environments that might be impractical, you might not even be allowed to install a new system service and open a new port. And maybe you don't even have a password to type into that login page. So I want to give you a glimpse of how to customize cockpits to these kind of environments and how to, to authenticate to it in other ways. Other ways. <clears throat> For those, um, you need to, for configuring and standing and embedding cockpit, you need to coarsely understand its components so that you know what the different things do so that you can plug them together in a different way and understand what they do. So what I've just shown you here with my little demo was the default structure. So this is probably what you see when you use cockpit the first time. So essentially everything is running on one machine. <clears throat> So first of all, all components in Cockpit, they community, communicate to each other with a standard JSON protocol on simple pipelines. So usually standard in and standard out. And this provides a lot of flexibility and customizability, as we'll see shortly. <clears throat> so first of all, uh, at the beginning of the chain is the browser. These browsers, they only speak HTTP and WebSocket. So none of the things that we usually need when we want to administer a Linux machine and its APIs. So we always need some kind of web server somewhere. And that's called cockpitws at the top. So this is where the HTTPS requests land. So the purpose of the web server is first to collect some credentials from the user. That can be by providing a login page and collecting the password, as you saw. 
But it can also do a lot of different things, like uh, it could uh, negotiate a Kerberos session with, with the server and the client. Or it can ask the client for a client certificate, the TLS certificate, that's commonly provided by smart cards and stuff. Or like something else, which we will see. And then after that, of course, uh, the web server's task is to deliver the HTML and JavaScript contents to the browser so that you actually see something. And yeah, so this web server runs as an unprivileged system user. So it by itself, it cannot really do anything to the system. And this is why uh, we need some helper to actually start a session. Like once we have some credentials, we need to start a PAM session. You need root for that. And so our standard component that you saw before, this is called cockpit session. This is a very small and auditable um, set URL root helper, which essentially collects the credentials that the web server picked up and then stuffs that into the PAM stack. And if all goes well, you have a Linux session. And then it essentially transitions over to the session lead of the Linux session and essentially disappears. And then, of course, it forwards this JSON pipe that I spoke earlier from the web server to the new session. And finally, what's happening in the session? The first uh, process in that session, the session lead, is called cockpit bridge. So you can think about this as the moral equivalent of what a bash is to an SSH session. So it's the thing that, uh, that, that launches all the actions that you actually want to do. So on its top end, it talks that JSON protocol that the JavaScript drives. And on the other side, it can do all the things that you need to, to talk to Linux services, like open files, open dbus connections, pick up dbus signals, open sockets, and all of the things that we use to implement pages like the storage, storage page. And of course, that is a very complex program. It does a lot of things. But on the other hand, it's um, relatively uncritical because that just runs in the Unix and the user session without any special privileges. So anything which you can do in an SSH session, Cockpit Bridge can do, no more, no less. <clears throat> but so here's the first thing. The web server and the, the login session, they don't really need to run on the same machine. So this is where it becomes interesting. So the most obvious replacement of this cockpit session thing that we saw earlier is SSH. Because if you think about it, it does exactly the same thing structurally. It takes some credentials, it forwards it in, in a standard output to a remote thing and starts the session there. And we can do this. So if we have, uh, let's go back into desktop mode. So we can talk to a remote machine here. Let's add a new one. So, OK, I've never seen that machine. Of course, I trust it. <laughs> so for simplicity, I'm just using normal user and password here. Of course, you can use an SSH key as well. And here we have a new server. And you see that the front page here looks a little different because this is like a RHEL 7 machine. It runs an older cockpit. So, and the front page was just different. So for this purposes, it just tells you that this is actually the remote machine that we talked to. But otherwise, I mean, it feels pretty much the same as we saw earlier, right? But this now has an interesting property because on this cockpit.dev machine, there is nothing cockpit specific running on the system. No web server, no extra open port. The only thing is the cockpit bridge thing. But as I already told you, that's rather uninteresting from a service management and also from a security point of view, because that's just a random program in your session. And you can put this principle to the max uh, if you completely disable the local sessions with cockpit session. So we call that a bastion host. So you pick one random computer in your network to be the cockpit web server. Uh, this could even run in a container if you want to. So because, as I said, this doesn't have a lot of privileges. It does, just needs to open a port and call SSH. And then completely disable local logins so that all the machines that you administer, they are not influenced by this web server thing. So let's show that. Of course, if you use a real bastion host, this looks a little nicer. But every cockpit installation can do this by default with this connect to option. So let's use the same machine. Admin, my super secret password. 
And there we go. So this is now, uh, the, the entire session is now running on this remote machine. You'll notice it looks a little different here. So this one now says, by the enterprise Linux server, before that it said Fedora, because that was my local one. And again, we see that the information here is from the remote system. <clears throat> okay. So, Cockpit supports uh, a lot of other authentication setups by default, which are common like in larger environments. Like, uh, identity management is very common. So, you normally get a Kerberos ticket when you log into your like, desktop session or even Windows machine. And then Cockpit can use that Kerberos ticket to get you a single sign-on. So if you go to log it to server colon 9090, you will immediately get a session as your user without any further login page. Of course, you need to enable this in IDM, but we support that. And browsers can also ask for TLS certificates, like you have a smart card reader and you want to authenticate with this. Latest cockpit versions can also use that if you enable it. <clears throat> and uh, a rather interesting case is Foreman. So this shows how you can embed cockpit into a different web application. So in recent versions, they grew a web console button. And that shows a very interesting seamless transition between two different authentication domains. Let me show you how that looks like. So, so this is Foreman. So normally this is being used to maintain like hundreds of thousands of hosts. So you can select one, and then you see this little web console button here. And if you press it, like it does its little authentication thingy, and you are immediately in that machine where you want to be. And everything works, like the terminal, you are the root user. And that works because Foreman already has SSH to all these target machines. So what that does is like, for, and if you notice the URL, that's Foreman, that's nothing cockpit or 1990-ish or so. So how Foreman does that is it uses a little cockpit WS uh, container or process or something and puts itself as a reverse proxy on top of that so that everything appears as the Foreman thing and you don't need an extra port. And it uses a custom authentication helper so that uh, just cockpit can just directly authenticate to Foreman. This is so that you don't circumvent like the reverse proxy and just get a SSH session for free. But yeah, I mean, I would like to show all of this, but it wouldn't fit into like the three minutes that I have or so. And also, I guess you would probably immediately forget the details again. So suffice it to say, like uh, this, this whole authentication setup is very um, powerful and you should keep it in the back of your mind that if you want to do such a thing, there is previous the prior art for this, and it's possible. <clears throat> so, but what I do still want to show you is kind of the opposite. So when I told you that you can replace this cockpit session helper with anything, this includes the possibility of literally nothing. And due to the common JSON protocol, we are not bound to this rigid structure. We can also connect um, our corporate web server directly to the bridge, like what we usually run in the session. Now, why would we want to do this? Like, take a step back, what I've just shown you before. I was logging into my browser, into my own machine with my own credentials. But actually, this is kind of stupid because I already have a running desktop session which knows who I am. So, what we could do is, as, as a first idea, we turn the whole thing upside down. And instead of the web server launching a session, we have an existing session and run the corporate web server in that, then as myself. So let's see how that, how that works. Where's my shell? Here. So that's the command that I show you. So I start a web server as my own user on port 9999. Don't need that. And voila, I have a session as myself. This is the, the policy kit prompt. Uh, it's in German. So <laughs> as you know, you can uh, have cockpit in two different modes, like an administrative mode or not. So for now, we just say no. Then I get like a kind of a read-only session. And yeah, this is my session. But hopefully now all of you have some alarm bells coming on, because what did I just do? Like I exposed my session to a public port on the network here, right? So, 
I hope nobody took advantage by, of, of that by now. <laughs> Let me shut it down. <laughs> ha ha, too slow. But yeah, so of course, obviously, we cannot use that because that's, oh my god, horribly insecure. But still, this idea seems attractive, right? I mean, what can we do to salvage this? Linux to the rescue. So what we can do is we put a little network namespace around the browser and the cockpit web server. And thus, we completely isolate this pair from the whole outside world. So the cockpit WS can open as many ports as it wants. And then the only thing that can happen with that is that this little browser can talk to it and nothing else. <coughs> and <coughs> yeah, and then of course we can do some more work to isolate the browser Chrome so that you don't have the URL bar and uh, other buttons to it because that would be quite useless in such a setup. I mean, there's only one place in the universe where you can get to. And yeah, we did that. We provided a little cockpit desktop script which essentially does all that, like create the namespace, start a browser. And for getting rid of the Chrome, you can use WebKit if it's available. And this then looks like this. <clears throat> so let's make this a little wider so that we don't get mobile mode. Oh, what happened? Right, and so here we have cockpit again, but this time with a, in a secure fashion because from the outside world there is no port 9999. And this already starts to look like reasonably decent, right? So we can make this a, even more tasteful if we hide away like all this menu here that is like not really relevant on the desktop. So we can show only a single frame, like the storage page that I was showing you early on. Yeah, and now, I mean, this starts to, to look like, like a, a desktop app, right? So it's kind of electron without electron. So if for some reason you don't like GNOME disks or you cannot use it, then this might be a use case in some, uh, in some environment. Or if you need a UI to manage Podman containers, then well, use Codman, uh, install Cockpit Podman and there are your containers on your desktop without any extra authentication theft. Right? <clears throat> so Cockpit Desktop is a relatively small shell script, so feel free to poke around with it, investigate it, what it does, and play around with it. And just imagine, of course, you can combine this with SSH and all the things that I've shown you earlier. So, <clears throat> so once you know about this structure, you can pretty much freely combine all these SSH and web servers and reverse proxies and custom authentication helpers to embed cockpit into the places where you want them to. <clears throat> okay, so as a conclusion, um, oops. Yeah, so cockpit provides a set of standard authentication protocols. I've only shown you the most simple ones here that are being used in today's modern like, computing deployments. And yeah, it's you can and due to the like the flexibility of the components, you can pretty much plug them in together in the way that you need. So, um, if you want to talk to us, here is where you can find us on our C. We have a mailing list, and there is our homepage, and of course all the code that I've shown here it's like available somewhere. So, and we have five minutes for questions. Thanks for your attention. Oh, all clear, great. Well, I guess everyone's just slumbering because it's really the bad time in the afternoon. Right? Okay, great then. Uh, How about pseudoers? Let's say if you want to <coughs> manage some volume groups, logical volumes, whatever. Um, as a regular user, I'm not allowed to do so. So if I'm logging in as a regular user with the appropriate pseudoers um, rules in place, can I make use of the, the, the cockpit interface as well? So the question was, like, if I have pseudo privileges, can I, uh, can I use cockpit for those as well? And yeah, of course. So uh, this is right now, this is what this box is for. So if you check this, that essentially means it will reuse your password to authenticate the pseudo. 
and then I can actually do these things. I, I mean, I've shown you with the storage page. I mean, I did the LVM thing. Uh, maybe your question was if you have specific pseudo rules. Yes. So uh, that doesn't work right now because we, we run all the administrative commands to like a, a root cockpit bridge. So the cockpit bridge then starts pseudo cockpit bridge essentially, and if that succeeds, then this is a channel which runs all the administrative commands. So we have some examples which use pocket rules, like on the firewall pages, but we are not currently making a lot of use for that. But of course, that's every page's decision. So, but this is currently the, like pretty, it ate pretty deeply into the cockpit architecture that we don't run sudo all the time, but we try and do it once. Also because it's pretty hard to, to get like immediate feedback, like to say instead of your system changes, we immediately want the cockpit page to reflect that. And if you're not sudo all the time, then it's essentially impossible to, to get that. So does it answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah? Uh, so basically these checkbox caches the password and you just replay it at the uh, um, uh, request when you run sudo. Mm -hmm. sudo runs bad. So basically you cannot do to factor authentication if, for example, SSSD configured to accept your to factor. So the question was if two-factor authentication works with Cockpit. So on the login page, this one, it totally works because that's just reflecting the PAM stack. And if you have like Google Authenticator or something, then this will just ask you for it. But you are right that if sudo wants to do this, this doesn't currently work. This is on our roadmap. We, in fact, just talked about it three days ago. So we have an idea how to fix this. And in fact, this, this checkbox will go away entirely because it's too confusing and it's kind of too static. So we are going to replace it with a more dynamic kind of become pseudo, drop pseudo button in the UI so that it also works with SSO and such. But yeah, so this is a weakness and we are working on it. Okay. Can okay. you talk about the other options drop down? What else is there for us? Well, right now there's only the other host. So this is what I've shown you with the bastion host. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, Options is kind of sort of a lie in the, but, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, just, uh, I was confused. I was thinking it was relating to other options for authenticating. So, yeah, no, so like... That's good to that we should change that string. That's right. Maybe there was another option in the past. Uh, well, okay. But, yes. uh, not anymore. Other options use this UI. <laughs> so, I would, I would imagine that at some point, Right. Yeah. Because it's on demand, it's not exactly. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, clients with the authentication might be there as well. Well, you wouldn't see. Uh, do we still have time? Yeah. So yeah, like the question was like if the client certificate authentication would be here. Well, the thing is, the login page, you only really see this when you do ask, uh, do use password authentication. Like with SSO, with smart card authentication, with uh, uh, and, and Cobras and so on, like you never see this. You get straight into the, 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 the UI. So this is why we don't actually want to put a lot of things here. So this is mostly for bastion host and password. But most of, so this is also why we want to move the pseudo thing because you would never see it in these cases and it's kind of bad. Okay, thanks a lot. And ask me in the hallway. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.